Thank you, Pamela. It's nice to be back. Um, but before I begin, I wanted to um, acknowledge some news that I heard this morning, some very sad news. Um, our friend, the artist, and musician, and educator, Terry Adkins, died on Friday of heart failure. And it kind of made preparing for today a little more difficult than usual. Um, and he left behind some uh, a wonderful, loving wife, Meryl, and two children, uh, Titus and Turia. And Turia is the same age that I was when my, uh, when my own mother died. So it was, it was moving to hear this. So could we just have a moment of silence for Terry? Thanks. Um, speaking of my mother, it's funny this, this, everybody likes to talk about their mothers, right? Um, I, uh, I grew up, my, my teenage years were spent in California and Palo Alto. And uh, every summer we would go hiking in the High Sierra. Um, I can't, there we go, that's better. And uh, actually it was very, it, it led to some health problems for my, for my mother actually. But we kept on going up there even though she couldn't. Um, and I think the first thing that I learned to draw as, a, as an aspiring young artist was mountains. And, um, and now I see a kind of uh, metaphorical um, significance to, to drawing mountains and going into the mountains and hiking in the mountains. We would hike for 10 days at a time um, really in the deep back country, uh, no exposure to anything modern except what we were carrying with us. And I was, uh, I now realize in a lot of ways that the, that idea of the long walk is something that I've dealt with uh, ever since. And the idea of, of large forces uh, causing other forces to other more intricate forces and complex forces to happen uh, it's a very, has become very important to me over the years. The Sierra Nevada mountains are very um, young, and they're, that means that they're sharp, not like the Appalachians, which are rounded and worn down by glaciers and time. The Sierra has had one pass of glaciers over them. And that pass led to an accumulation of water and, and the causing of some erosion, which le has led to a very tenacious form of life that lives in the crevices of these high mountains. So simplicity iterates complexity. As you can see in this picture, there's those green patches of of, of grass, moss, are surrounded by a really blasted uh, landscape. And um, this, this picture was probably taken about 12,000 feet. And this one also. You can see the trees in the distance. That's, that's about 10,000 feet. That's as high as trees get. The other thing I liked about drawing mountains was that um, you can get the proportions wrong and they still look like mountains. You know, when you're, when you're, uh, that, was that the studio school people laughing? Because <laughs> when, you're, when you're doing figure drawing, uh, you got to get the proportions a little more right. Uh, you know, I was, I hope, uh, I hope some of you got to see the uh, Pearlstein show downstairs. It was very resonant for me to see because 
not after after figuring out and learning how to draw mountains, I did go to the Palo Alto Cultural Center and learned how to draw from the model. And just seeing the mastery of Perlstein and the touch, um, not only the, his ability to get the proportions really, really right, but his touch. It reminded me that no matter what you do in your work, no matter what your ideas are, you've got to have the touch. And so when you look at the sh things that I've selected to show you tonight, most of them really do involve ideas uh, and systems uh, and rules and legal and illegal uh, moves, as I like to call them. But there's also something you don't get from a PowerPoint or a slideshow or an image of something, um, and that's, that's the sense of touch. Um, I, I, don't, I don't have any captions on these pictures, so feel free to just interrupt me and say, what size is that, what year is that, what material is that, if you like, so we can keep it informal. If you have another question that you think you might not remember for the end, feel free to just interrupt me. That's perfectly fine. This, um, this painting is from about 84, and it's 8 by 8 feet, I painted with a broom. Uh, using uh, some homemade paint and house paint, and it's on it's on found cardboard. I probably found it outside of a warehouse in Soho. Um, up to this point, and one never knows when to start a slide talk, you know. But but the pictures that you aren't seeing that come before this dealt a lot with the materiality of paint and the phenomenology of how paint dries and what it, what is paint made of. I had a great teacher at Cornell University named Peter Kahn, the brother of Wolf Kahn, who taught two very important courses in the art history department. Uh, one was techniques and materials of painting and drawing, and one was techniques and materials of printmaking. So he got me into the idea of mulling my own uh, pigments and, and making my own paint. And the structure in this, the structures began to emerge when I started getting bored with watching the paint dry. When I would make these material-oriented works, I would generally just make a batch of paint. And it involved various unconventional kinds of materials, like um, uh, ashes, uh, salt. Salt's not a good idea. I learned that the hard way especially when it's water-based. Maybe if you mix it with oil, it would be more effective. <laughs> but all my salt paintings just kind of fell apart rapidly. Um, and then I also worked with hair. I would make just paint out of hair, which is really hard to manage. But once it's dry, it looks pretty good. Um, so one, you know, once I'd exhausted myself, if, it, it, or my exhausted my interest in, in looking at just fields of paint and as, as they uh, dried and exhibited their intrinsic characteristics, I started getting interested again in form and in structures that, that might somehow um, evoke the structure inside the materiality of the paint. Um, this is from around the same time. It's a painting on silk. I did a lot of paintings on silk, stretched and unstretched. This is unstretched, so the this branching thing, this branching structure, uh, initially painted in, in a very wet uh, distemper paint, dried and uh, um, what's it called? Yeah, cockled, cockled the silk, and then once that was dry, I could scumble over the I could scumble over the cockle, and that's what that is: scumbled cockle painting. Never thought of that. But branching is something that is kind of comes and goes in my work. I, I've returned to it in a, in a very different way recently. This is uh, Distemper on Linen. It's about 60 inches square. 
So there's a, you know, I was trying to kind of mechanize this branching and arborization thing. I, I, I was still recovering from my very intermittent experiments with LSD, but I remember that one of the things that I liked and disliked about LSD was thoughts tended to, every thought tended to unleash a series of choices and, and um, if you follow one of those series of choices, that leads to another series of choices. So this idea of arborization and branching um, was interesting to me, not just on a visual level, but on a, um, on a conceptual and um, cerebral level. And then this out, the exterior of this, of this branching form being connected together uh, was something that just sort of needed to happen. I wanted to see a complex form that, uh, that, that whose exterior perimeter was somehow had a reason to, to, to have this particular shape. So I would repeat sometimes angles, sometimes curves, overlap them. This is also about, what's it, maybe six feet square. Um, and this, le this leads to a kind of generative uh, way of, of picture making. This is probably the biggest one, 84 inches square. Can't you tell it was like the neo-expressionist time? I was. Uh, I was I was in my 20s. I you know I, I was I felt influenced. I remember Mel Bachner was making these really powerful zooming structure things on shaped canvases. I don't know if anybody remembers those, but me, but uh, and him. Uh, but this 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 may be one of the first of the pictures that I um, made using repeated. Um, typographical or, or, or n numerical forms. So I made, a, I made a chain of twos, so number two, circumambulating the surface, and then connected them in various ways. And maybe it's two chains of twos. I haven't really analyzed this lately. But in the smaller or subsequent works into the later, mid, later 80s, this is the number two and the number one, I believe. Um, yeah, and what I was interested, what I was thinking about at this time was, was making something that had a kind of unitary power, a gestalt reason for being, but an intricate edge, and an edge that, that repeated itself, but it repeated itself in an un unusual way. So this. The idea of repetition really um, necessitated distortion. That's the number five. So these are distemper on silk, stretched 19 by 19 inches. And then this one is probably also about six feet square. And I think I was responding to a book that has continued to be interesting to me uh, called uh, Gertel Escherbach by um, Douglas Hofstetter. Who, uh, he introduced me to this notion of recursion of things. Uh, and I was also becoming aware of fractals. Uh, and fractals are recursive forms that are made of, of s small copies of themselves. Uh, so this picture is a, started with large S forms chained together, and then the, the, the pathway of the S was made of S's. This is a drawing on museum board, about 14 by 11 inches. Uh, at around the later 80s, I took think about a year off to make 100 ink drawings. This came right about that time. And they had a lot to do with, with this recursive idea and with, and with a kind of increased fanatical devotion to precision. Uh, preci precision with distortion. 
Um, and let's see what's next. Maybe I'll be able to elaborate on that. Um, I would generate with a pencil a, 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 an, an endless line, I think is how I like to refer to it, or a, a number of endless lines, meaning a closed loop. And a closed loop has an inside and an outside. And so if you make a circle and you color the inside black, and the outside's going to be white. If you flip it and you end up with an eight, you twist it and you end up with an eight form, you'll have two black forms. So if you keep twisting it and stretching it and distorting it, you still, there's an inside of the pathway and an outside of the pathway. Um, and so I did quite a lot of that. Uh, this picture the, where you see these um, sort of lozenge type forms, the, uh, where, the, where the intersections happen is where the, where the boundary happens. The inside is a sort of disguise. I, I got, um, I was trying to do these on the computer and they looked completely dead and I think they needed a certain kind of life and a certain kind of evidence of the hand. Um, that's pretty obviously something I care about a lot. So that first, this one here is, is more random in terms of its lines crossing and uncrossing and, uh, and this next one uh, is more circular. And so I drew rather slowly. I, I, you can't make a, a gestural scribble like this and still find the inside and outside of, of a picture like this. So I had to make sure that when I was making an intersection that I could parse the, um, the intersection and, and, and be consistent and complete to the, to the rule behind the picture. The, and, you know, this is pretty early for me in terms of rule generation. I mean, it's a rather dumb rule. I think probably most of the people in this room did something like this while they were supposed to be paying attention in class in junior high school or something. I just wanted to take it to an extreme. So this, the last two you saw are 30 by uh, 40 by 30 inches uh, India ink on paper and this one. 87, 88. So, but they were generated with a pencil, obviously, a hard pencil, which was usually erased afterwards. I've always, I've had a long love affair with India ink going back to, um, to comic book days, my initial ambition. I remember only, only 40 years ago, just being around the corner here on my first visit to New York and applying to Parsons School of Design and illustration and showing them my portfolio with my meticulous ink drawings and, and not getting in to illustration. They said, you can't get into it. You don't, you don't, you're not a, an illustrator. So they knew something about me that I didn't. So they said, you're going to be a fine artist. I said, but I don't want to be a fine artist. You, know, you can make money in comic books. You get $16 a page. So it, it seemed to me to be an obvious uh, notion after doing a number of these kind of knotted pathways that had an inside and an outside to, to unknot the pathway. And so rather than have lines crossing themselves and returning to the point of origin, I started making things that were endless loops that were just maniacally distorted. So this is basically, this has one inside and one outside. I think of it as one shape, but of course it's also many shapes. So that, that was also 40 by 30. Now this is back down to small size. This is 11 by eight and a half. A favorite size for me, very, um, a very human size. I, I, the sizes of my works have become increasingly important to me. I think that, you know, there's certain drawings that are the size of your hand, there's certain drawings that are the size of your face, there's certain drawings that are works that are the size of your body. And I'm, I'm, I want to remind people that these works are made by a person. I think we lose sight of that sometimes. 
So this is about 80, this is about 90, I think. And this is uh, the largest enamel painting, one of the two largest that I've ever made. It's three feet by eight feet. And I think it's important, especially in a school setting, to show the clunkers as well as the hits, you know. And I didn't hate it enough to throw it away. <laughs> Spent a lot of time on it, but I, I and, and it's I learned a lot doing it. Um, so it has it basically has that endless line thing which you've seen before in the ink drawing, but it also has a grid drawn on it that demarcates every square foot, and. Um, it's just too much. I was just trying to do too much with one painting. Well, that's what I learned from this. It was like, hey, come on, break it down. Break it, try to do uh, one thing well and then move on. And this is not complexity. This is like busyness. It's, it's a mess. Another small drawing. It, it, at this time, I was m sort of mixing two drawings, so two lattice works. Uh, and then seeing what happens when I kind of mesh them by executing the, uh, the kind of inside-outside rule. So now we're up to about 92. You can see kind of a radical jump here. Um, I was having a kind of a personal crisis. My son was uh, three years old, and my marriage was a mess. So I started making these very different paintings just to kind of shake it all out. So rather, I wasn't really executing things meticulously. I was making adjustments and making lines wider and narrower. So this painting, this is again, going back to the notion of touch. This is a kind of a, I can only tell you, there's lots of paint on this painting. To you, it looks like, you know, uh, could have been a silk screen. But the adjustments, a little more white, a little more black, make that whiter, make that narrower, change the colors. It would probably started as like blue and red or something. I was repainting and repainting and repainting. And, um, but it's a formal thing that I've carried with me. I now call this kind of um, formal exercise, the zigzagging kind of rebounding forms, angry forms. It's somewhat of an homage to Charles Birchfield. Now, this one is called uh, keloid, in reference to the scar that never heals, I think. Or is that what a keloid is? Kind of a scar that builds onto itself. And this one went through many, many changes. Where the brown is, there was lots of stuff happening, so I was taking it out. I don't think these have ever been shown. I think, um, but I thought you should see them. This picture does kind of stand as, for me, uh, as sort of the first of the, of my 19 by 15 inch body of work, really official first painting of that uh, body of work, which I'm still making. And it's called uh, Untitled Yellow Mouth, 1991. It's 19 by 15 inches. And um, it's yellow and black, and I made a number of yellow and black paintings in the first couple of years, and I was, and I was falling in love with this sign painter's enamel more and more. Uh, I loved the, um, oh, I liked it because it was cheap, too. That's true. It was, it still is very uh, affordable. Uh, I also liked it because I was painting on metal, and I really enjoyed painting on metal. Um, Alan Serrett, some of you might remember and know Alan Serrett, the great sculptor, took me for a walk in Brooklyn in about uh, 89. And he took me to the scrapyard over there, Glans Metals on South 8th Street. And he said, this is my garden. I want you to take a walk in my garden with me. And I, and I found these slabs of metal, one of which was this exact piece of metal. And I've been copying it ever since. I liked the idea, you know, once I found this size that I liked, I liked the sort of standardization. It felt very liberating for me to, to standardize the scale of these things and then do all sorts of different things within it, as, as I hope you'll see. I'm going too slow. I'm talking too much. You need to see more pictures. This is another yellow and black picture. Um, and this also marks a kind of turning point. It, I started 
making the rules just a little more complex. And, uh, um, instead of making just a kind of floppy, endless line, a biomorphic line with an inside and an outside, I thought, well, if you kink the line, just kink it with acute angles. And I was surprised that this, there was this kind of emotional, psychological thing that happened. And the yellow and the black was kind of shrill. And I remember showing this to my neighbor, this uh, clothing guy next door to me on Canal Street, not into art at all. And he came over to my studio one day and he said, did you just make that? I said, yeah. And he said, I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I said, that's okay. You can hate it. It's all right. He said, it's jumpy. It's really jumpy. It's making me nervous. I'm getting jumpy. I'm getting all jumpy looking at this thing. He was a non-art guy, but it was, I thought it was such a genuine reaction. I really thought I'm doing something right, you know. And for the next couple of years, he apologized. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm so sorry. I called your work jumpy. You know? We became good friends. And he never stopped apologizing. I said, no, thank you. It's really, I'm, I feel good. It made, it made you jumpy. It did supposed to do that to some degree or other. But that was very liberating to do the, to do the cute, acute angle. And then I just started thinking, I could do lots of things that are, wow, I didn't even touch the keyboard. Let's go back. I can do a lot of things um, on this surface having to do with small, intense, compressed imagery. Uh, um, as you can see on this one, and I haven't talked about this yet, but I will now. I don't want these pictures to be field pictures. None of them are to mean to imply some sort of other world out there. Um, in abstract expressionism, there's often times, and, and I was very influenced and, and flipped out by abstract expressionism, there's this, uh, there's this effect of some other energy field, space, world uh, frequency that that just permeates everything. You see it in Pollock. You see it in Mark Toby, for example. You see it in a lot of people. And I wanted, I wanted my pictures to rebound from the edge. And this is a, this is another way of making them rebound from the edge and feel compressed and intense and more concentrated. And I also was trying to make a more and more of a case for powerful small pictures. I was. was deeply influenced in the 80s by, uh, by um, Bill Jensen and Tom Noskowski, two artists who are really good at making intense small works, and continue to be. So then I just started thinking more and more of ways to generate an image using a simple series of rules. I'm not going to go through the rules because we don't have as much time as I thought. Sorry, we got 10 after 7. But Suffice it to say, I, I, this is a motif that I developed in about 93, and I continue to use in different ways, having to do with a kind of self-generating structure. Um, and it's, again, you could call it doodling. Uh, we were just, uh, Melissa and I were just talking about Lori Ellison before the talk today, and I feel a kinship, a great kinship with Lori, I uh, have for many years. and, and um, I winced when I read Roberta Smith's review on Friday because she used the word doodle. And I thought that was unfair of her. Hope you're not here, Roberta. Intricacy, uh, intricacy is not doodling. Uh, the other, another term that I'm not excited about is the word obsessive. Uh, when artists make detailed things are they are they mentally ill or something is that what people think of? or do they just have to put in more time to make the thing because it needs to be made so what i did with this self generating crystal type system which i started by call, i started calling it conversation and it led to other things and just lattice i think this is called distorted red lattice the generative, the first generative moves on this kind of push to the lower right, and then the generative moves in this one push to the upper left. This is a small, one of those hand-sized drawings. This is an eight and a half by 11 uh, uh, pencil drawing, 11 by eight and a half, sorry. 
So I got into I I got into keeping the same kind of generative structure, but just distorting it. So it's uh, sort of about 95 now. It's actually, a lot. Some of the things that I'm going to be showing you now are going to jump around time-wise because I revisit motifs that I feel I can do more things in. So this will jump around a little bit. This is O2 or O3. Still that that structure that you saw in the first one, the drawing, but a 19 by 15 enamel on aluminum. But the patches of color um, are determined by how much I could paint in a day, basically. I just, so, and in this picture, this is 29 by 23 enamel on aluminum. Um, also, maybe maybe two days. I think this is a larger thing. So, painting these these shapes was a sort of. I wanted to go against that that grid that that underlies the picture. This is nineteen by fifteen. Some mid aughts. Um, I'm going to go forward and then maybe come back. No. This is a comb picture. I, I wasn't sure that I, I thought I included a couple other comb pictures. I made some pictures involving uh, color bars that would send comb tines towards one another and interlock in this way. So at the top of the painting, for example, you'd have a red bar, and at the bottom you'd have a black bar, and in the middle you'd have red and black lines interlocked and I started taking this kind of motif and turning it 90 degrees and making it more intricate and making it recursive so this is a result of one of those things but with the color drained out this is a kind of interpenetrating uh, triangle motif coming out of that comb notion this is where I get very frustrated because I, I, I should have a detail of every one of these things because there's a lot of polishing and a lot of uh, what I call policing a painting. Once I've once I've got the painting laid out, and I want all the lines to be completely consistent and complete and not touching, so that they really exist in a kind of static tension that satisfies me. I have to go back into it and and verify it all. And you can't see that in a picture like this. That's just a, just the way it is. This is called sagging grid. We're about 04. I do have a detail of that. So the divisions, the dis as you can see in this detail, the divisions, I think it's actually called sagging grid with glitch. I kind of threw the glitch in there in the middle, that little cross form on the lower right. Well, not so little. Basically, the sizes of, the, of those voids were not satisfying to me, and I thought it it could it could handle the, the strength of the image could handle this kind of um, disobedience of the rule. This is another kind of sagging grid image, uh, pencil on paper. This is this is uh, 29 by 23, 1999. Also with this curve at the edge, um, just I've been just looking. I, I think the edges of paintings are are kind of an underrated area. When I teach, I'm constantly pointing to the corners of things in my students' work and saying, the "Upper left really works, but the lower right just you know you've got to take responsibility for every part of your of your work." And um, it doesn't mean it has to be the same. It just has to be considered. This is eight by six inches pencil on paper. Uh, this is another one of those smaller drawings, eight by six. And the last 
seven or eight years, I've returned to the meandering line, but in a different, with a different uh, desired result. And it, this oscillates, I think, between this thing I mentioned earlier about fields. That you, you, when you're in the middle of this thing, you are in a kind of inchoate, um, uh, inchoate uh, amalgamation of, of material coalescing or uh, but then when you get to the edge you realize wait a minute it's a drawing it's it's just it's just a drawing and I'm very excited I'm continually excited by that tension this is a gouache 11 by eight and a half there's a comb picture like the blue one a little while before, but in, done in a very different way. Um, pencil and colored pencil, probably 2006. It was done for a cover, uh, of, was it, I think it actually has 17 different um, independent things alternating between brown and graphite and it was done for uh, Stephen Ratcliffe who's a poet who likes to write poems with a given number of lines and he had a, did an entire book of 17 line poems so I made this drawing for that book this is also this uh, eight by six and a half or six and a quarter blue paper blue stationery Nineteen by fifteen uh, enamel on aluminum, two thousand three. Interested in mapping continually, and and uh, it's funny. One of the things I taught when I did a, a marathon here was I I made everybody go outside and take a walk, and then come back inside and try to draw the walk as if they saw it from above. And it, and, and mapping is. I've always loved maps and finding my way with maps done long bicycle rides in, in Europe uh, before the, you know, the thing, the thing you carry in your hand that tells you where you are. Um, so I think of this picture as like the yellow is the auto route and, and the, the blue is the uh, uh, national and then the smallest lines are the departemental and like in, in, in France. This is a pencil drawing, 11 by eight and a half, a similar motif. This, this picture, be, it, you know, fits in less and less, and it's kind of one of an image that some people think is kind of iconic for me. It's called Battery, and it's, it was made over 90, uh, 96 and 97, and I haven't returned to it much at all. Um, it kind of, it, it t when you talk about pictures kind of making themselves, this one kind of did that. I was circumambulating with a pencil, with the, making little ovals that don't touch and then paying attention to the little saddle shapes in between them. And, but, but somehow, as I ran out of space, I just intuitively made the circles smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's the result I got. But that concentric thing has, has stayed with me. This is, a, this is also 29 by 23 enamel on aluminum. And it's, um, it comes out of the combs, but rather than ha having combs interpenetrating from top and bottom and side by side, this, this is a kind of a, a comb that penetrates itself. So the, the vertical, it's the kind of generative spine of the picture. But again, it, it, tries, to, it tries to create a, a tension against the edge that kind of almost contradicts its, its initial form. It's another kind of unusual picture with having to do with um, with knots called rictus 29 by 23 showing you very little of this kind of geometric rectilinear stuff I think there's some more coming up this is called enter the faces from 1996 and it led to an, a painting called taste the houses um, 
that's an LSD reference. Synesthesia. Was, both titles were given to me by other people. The Enter the Faces was made up by my son, who was about seven, and this was a, a friend who said when he was on acid, he would walk down the street tasting the houses. Um, and this uh, this was a, this picture was abandoned. Where the brown is, I I could have kept iterating. I think there's a detail. Yeah, there's a detail of the middle of the picture. I could have kept iterating, but I was just getting. Um, getting nuts with it. So I thought, can the picture survive being abandoned? And I, and I think it did enough. But I le it led to uh, not wanting to abandon something. So this is 19 by 15 again, and I did carry it through to its end, and I ended up with this kind of, s what I thought was a kind of organic form result kind of growing on the grid but as, as the, um, as the iterations accumulated, a feedback, almost a kind of feedback loop. So that, those, that group of rectilinear things, orthogonal things, had to do with dividing the surface in half and, and the, leaving one part un, undivided and, and continuing to divide. So I've, uh, uh, that's something that it's continued but in various, various forms. So this, this is a series of columns in which the volumes inside doubles as you move from left to right, and it's ex exponential. So I think this, the title for this is 1-1028 or something. Plus 2 to the something power. I can't calculate it right now. And it led to a, a unusual horizontal. I mean, you can do more iterations if you go horizontally. I guess that's what I was thinking about. So this is actually the, the size of these columns is determined by the Fibonacci sequence. So it's 1, 1, 2, 5, 8, 13, and so on. But going vertically, the, the forms are, are doubled. And this was laid out in a pencil. So there's, as you can see, it's, m it's more precise. But again, this is the failure of PowerPoint and, and the failure and the impossibility of a slide lecture like this. You can't see this picture. You can see a picture of this picture. It's like a picture of a picture of a picture, uh, but you get a, you get a vague idea of where th what the work is about. Uh, so occasionally I do try to remove the hand somewhat so that I can get the precision that I need to to to, to fulfill the requirements of the picture. So this is also about division, but the divisions happen on a diagonal. So every move in this picture has to do with dividing a triangle into two parts. Well, the first move is to divide the rectangle into two triangles, and then from then on, every triangle is divided in two. And this is a result that you get. Now, if you, if you look this over really carefully, you'll find mistakes, because I did it by hand. I could have done this on a computer in just, you know, in five seconds, probably. I mean, getting it onto the surface of the panel would have been a lot of work. Um, but to me, that was also very important. And then designing the colors to these triangles was a kind of trial and error process, which I did with a pencil and, a, and an eraser. So I could make sure that the white and the, uh, that each, any given color wouldn't touch its own color laterally or um, wouldn't touch it laterally. They can, they could touch point to point. That's, that's, this is the larger one, 29 by 23, and this is the smaller one, 19 by 15. And I took that idea of precision into um, into into the comb motif, but really broke the comb, the idea of the recursive comb down to to just the two tines of any given comb. Um, and it led this actually came out of some printmaking, so we'll, it'll make more sense when you see a print. This is called kinked non-slice. I don't know why this is here, or this. This is called Earthless. This is 39 by 30. But I did say that I've been readdressing this notion of, of the loop. But it's, it's, it feels altogether different from the things I was doing uh, 20, oh, 25 years ago. 
and I mentioned the term angry form when I showed you those divorce paintings. Um, and this picture is called uh, Sawtoothed Angry Form, I think. So for those of you who are sitting anywhere behind the second row, it's probably really hard to tell that there are little sawtooths going against all of these forms, um, which kind of evokes that yellow and black painting from 91 as well, but in a very different way. I think this is more Birchfieldian than the than that one. What looks prickly to you in the back is really um, a series of, of arrow heads all pointing in the same direction along the pathway of the, of the, um, of the drawing. This is a drawing 11 by 8 and a half ink on paper. But the arrows have, arrows have been really surfacing more and more in my work. And this was one of the first, um, I've done things like this with arrows running along them. This is not one, this is, a, this is from about three years ago. It's called uh, Switchbacked Loops. Kind of a homage to my old hiking days. This is, um, five by three inch pencil drawing. What's that doing here? Good Lord. We saw that already. I'm going to show you some things that are kind of, you could, you, you might think might have been done by someone else. Um, some of these have been shown. Some of them haven't. Uh, I think when I turned 50, I made a couple of um, figurative things, and um, and I enjoyed it, and so I gave myself permission to break all of my rules. So now we're going to see some rule breakers, although the, 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 the every artist follows a system to some degree or other, don't they? And a face has two eyes and a nose and a mouth and wrinkles and that's usually uh, recognizable as such. Uh, Jackie Sacocho is making these incredible uh, paintings that she calls portraits, and they're abstractions. But it's wonderful that she uses that term, and the titles evoke that as well. So I'm, I don't want to sound defensive, but I probably do. But I'm, but I'm, I don't care if people don't think I should be doing this. I thought, why not express raw emotion? Um, I certainly had as much fun with the wrinkles as I do with, with my intricate pathways or my sawtooths or meticulous repainting and policing of pictures. I mean, these don't get policed like, a, like an abstraction does. But they get policed in their own ways. You know, you want to get the intensity of a fold correct and um, you want to inject a little humor. And I was, uh, I was freaked out about turning 50. That's understandable, isn't it? So, and I was freaked out about George Bush. <laughs> Who isn't? Who wasn't? So this one's called uh, Nobody Listens to the Old People. I was, you know, he, these jokers were sending people off to die in wars that they would never have gone to be in themselves. All a bunch of draft dodging losers, as far as I'm concerned. And I was interested, and I've continually been interested in the, the notion of timelessness in art. And I, that, you know, for us to be obsessed with being the first to do something or to do it, uh, you know, to do what somebody never did before, or place ourselves in a certain art, art historical context, I think it's very distracting and, and very limiting to us as artists. I think we should feel a kinship with, with everything that has been made. And I don't mean just art. I mean, we need to be 
engaged with the whole of human endeavor. Did I show? I didn't show any other flat people. I've been doing flat people since I made a Valentine for my beloved of uh, of us flat. Uh, funny, is it Valentine's Day? It's really soon. Yeah, Friday. Yeah, so this is this is uh, um, this is called Flat Red Girl. Oh, there's another one. Yeah. I don't remember what she's called. I think she's called Boneless. Boneless Flat Red Girl. <laughs> because in this one, she's not particularly fat. Flat. You, you notice, she's not fat either, but you, you, you'll notice her, her right shoulder, which is, yeah. Now her, yeah, her right shoulder. She's upside down, so it's her right shoulder and on our right. It goes around and over her knee. And I was very excited that I was actually not putting things beside each other. There was a sort of a shell of illusionistic space going on in there. And I was having fun painting a drawing. This, I, I drew this in Sharpie on, a, on an aluminum panel, and then I followed the Sharpie lines in, in enamel and then in black, and then I painted the red and the white around the black. I have a detail of that one, too. And, and after I had done a lot of these old man pictures, um, my good friend Mark Greenwald, who may be here somewhere, he said, I don't think those are men at all. I, th I think they're, uh, I thought I had a picture here. He said, I think they're scrotum people. <laughs> With the wrinkles, I guess it was the wrinkles that got him going about that. Because we're all... So yeah, it's funny when I was looking at this the other day. I was, how, how do we go from a vagina to a cave, and then the cave looks more? It's, it's more wrinkly than I remember because I've done a number of cave things since then. So I went face, scrotum, penis, vagina, cave. It's a logical progression, isn't it? Yeah. And then here's a sort of the. This is kind of closed the door on cave for a while. This this is 29 by 23. What happened? Can we get that back? We're almost done. Am I, did, is this what happens when you run over time? You just, they just turn the light off. <laughs> Maybe the bulb went, oh my goodness. It would be a pity. I think there's only about 10 more pictures. Well, should we talk amongst ourselves? This picture was completely painted in different colors, and I changed all the colors, except for the, the sort of ground surface, which was incomplete. I, I didn't have to redo that entirely. I redid parts of it. In terms of formal execution, I don't, don't do that much adjustment. I know that at the studio school, the eraser is as important as the charcoal. I don't do much erasing. So we're almost done with this. You've been very patient to listen to all this. Uh, 
pharynx dentata, eight by six and a quarter, uh, six and a quarter by eight. The teeth start, oh, there's, there's one of those things. The, the, the teeth start looking like tombstones, I think. You know, this is called member in, in honor of Mark Greenwald. And then um, going back to that precise green and blue uh, thing, which I'm sure you all remember, this, I, 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 I remember, I, I didn't look at what the blurb said about my talk until this afternoon. It talked so much about my printmaking. I thought, oh, fiddlesticks. I don't have very many prints to show you. Um, but this is a book uh, that, that kind of spells out the construction of a, one of those interlocking recursive comb pictures in 36 pages. And uh, each page is about 18 by 14 inches. So this, I, I hoodwinked the publisher into giving me two unbound sets of the, of the pages and framed one for a show. And um, I enjoyed the nonverbal explanation of my process. This is a woodcut that I did not cut. I made a drawing and had the wood cut by a cabinet maker. And it still took uh, two years. It was one of the most arduous projects I ever did. Um, I'm currently working on some sculpture that I started all the way back at the beginning of the lecture. You remember those arborization things? Um, I used to, you know, smoke a lot of pot and make these things out of toothpicks and then give them to my friends. I'd take grape, you know, you eat the grapes, the grape stem dries out, you connect all the ends of the grape stems together and, and you know, give it to your friend. And, um, and th then I started thinking, boy, these could, if these were scaled up, they could really look kind of serious. But how can you scale them up and cast them in metal? Well, in the 80s, I didn't know anything about 3D scanning or 3D printing. And, and, but now I do. And this is a 40-inch long scaled up version in bronze of one of those toothpick sculptures. And we're making, uh, making a number of these things. And that's what the detail looks like. The pattern on there is not an enlargement of the toothpick's grain. It's actually a, an evidence of the printing process where the computer printer prints plane by plane uh, so you can see things kind of lining up. They may not always line up because we have technical issues in terms of assembling these things for casting, but this was basically made, it fits in my hand, the actual sculpture. Scan, enlarged, printed, cast, with, and then, you know, finished by hand. This is another one. The original sculpture is about two by three inches. And I didn't think it was complicated enough when I held it in my hand. I thought, maybe I should add some toothpicks. This looks, so this, this change in scale is really exciting to me. Six inches long, some, oh, uh, the finished? Oh, like that, 30, 40 inches. And then this is a, a drawing of the shadow of, of a couple of the toothpick sculptures. I'm, still looking at a way to get two dimensions out of three. It's I'm just kind of oscillating back and forth. Uh, here's some new arrow paintings. I didn't really talk you through how the process happened, but I, you saw that little paint drawing of arrows, and, and this, I was in, think, t telling you about explaining how pictures are made, and then all of a sudden I thought, I, I gotta make paintings that are nothing but arrows, and arrows that go nowhere. Uh, and yet, now I'm beginning to think these might be a little bit about politics. Where the, I, th I think this is called um, the good guys, meaning the red arrows. Yeah, this is called underdogs. So these are 19 by 15 inches. And they're done again very carefully with pencil line and then painted really carefully. But when the errors are much more evident when you see them in the flesh. 
And lastly, I'm just going to show a group of, um, of drawings I made using a typewriter uh, I'm still making. And I never thought I'd make drawings on a typewriter, but I, I, and I love typewriters and collect them and like to write letters on them, but I never thought they would make their way into my work. Somehow I began to think punctuation had some sort of energy to it. Maybe it was the arrows that led to that. So I made a group of things using um, parentheses. I found a typewriter in Italy that has a half space ratchet so you can really pack the letters in. A lot of American machines have a full space ratchet so you can't get a regular overlap of things. So that led to some happy things. So these are all parentheses doing various things. On eight and a half by 11 paper, that's a detail of rightward parentheses. And then I started doing sequences of numbers and all of a sudden these patterns emerged that I wasn't really expecting. I guess if I'd thought hard enough about it, I would have figured it out, but I didn't. So these are, yeah, because of the half space ratchet, I can, I can, I could hit, you know, I'd, I'd hit one space, two space, three space, four space, five, and then go to the next line over one space, and I, I do one space, two space, three. So they're, they're just interlocking just enough. There we are. And they, they, but then I wanted to make them read more um, uh, beautifully in many directions. So now you, in this one, you can get this one, two, three uh, sequence on the outside edges and on the inside going left to right. And so I started, then I realized, geez, these are like, uh, these are like palindromes. So they're these sy symmetries and I, I can still obey my rules, but I, but I can do them using a machine, but it's not a machine that you plug in. It's a machine that responds to the pressure of the hand. So this tool still can have a certain humanity to it. And I found it really, um, exciting. I just kept on making these things. And then so I was at the academy uh, in Rome and sh some of the people were seeing these things. And I said, these look like numerical palindromes, don't they? And they said, yeah, they do. But there's a very, there's a number of palindromes that the Romans wrote. And so I started using these Latin palindromes. And this is the, this is the last slide. Um, Roma tibi subito motibus ibit amor. Rome to you love will come with sudden passion. So that was a kind of nice way to close out that group of drawings, which I'm continuing to do and hopefully will show one of these days. That is all. <laughs>